Hello, uh, we're going to be taking a look at the Garmin TCX file. Uh, this is the file that on your head unit, uh, each data point will be recorded. So every track point it will be recorded there for every lap. So let's take a uh, look at inside the file. So here's an example of a track point. As you can see, there's a timestamp, there's a latitude and longitude, there's a GPS altitude, there's the distance traveled so far. It, it records also my heart rate there, 100 beats per minute. My cadence is 83 RPM. And what will also be very important is we'll have to know our current speed. And the speed here is uh, about 6.16 meters per second. That's about 22 kilometers an hour. And next, you can see that my wattage is 242. Okay. This is actually the next track point. As you can see, it's a little bit different. My heart rate's gone up from 100 to 101 beats per minute. My cadence has gone down to 77 RPM. The speed has dropped to 5.8 uh, meters per second. And my wattage is still, I'm still chucking along at 242 watts. Okay. Let's take a little deeper look at inside this uh, Checkpoint, and let's see what kind of information we're going to need in order to do our computation. The most important thing we need is uh, an accurate estimate of speed. And uh, here I use um, a Garmin speed sensor attached to the wheel. This is um, more responsive and more accurate than using the GPS function. Uh, next thing that's crucial is the wattage. And where do I get my watts? Uh, I get it from my power meter pedals. My power meter pedals uh, record both sides. And um, so it's not just doubled one side of the wattage. Okay. So hopefully that's uh, pretty accurate. One thing that we don't have recorded here is acceleration. And we're gonna need that uh, to plug into the formula other values here, like my heart rate and cadence, are, are irrelevant to this computation. Okay. So let's take a moment to talk about acceleration. I mean, acceleration is just the difference in speed per unit time. And suppose on our Garmin we take the recorded data at some particular time, let's call it t. And uh, so we look at the track point data, and basically the, the speed reported at that um, time point t is actually the average speed between t minus delta t and t where delta t is the uh, time that elapsed between uh, this particular time point and the previous time point okay and on the garmin pretty much delta t can be set to be exactly one second so we think about it uh, T, at time T, we'll get the information about the velocity of T, the average velocity of T between T minus delta T and T. And so, you know, the um, basically V of T gives us the average in that interval. Similarly, we can uh, move forward one, one position, T plus delta T, delta T being one second, so that's one second later than T. The velocity reported at that particular uh, track point is the average of the velocity between t and t plus delta t. Okay, so uh, Garmin, uh, you have to set it so that it records once a second and um, I'm not sure by default whether it does that, so um, there is a setting. Uh, Robert Chung points out that uh, if we take the simplistic approach to acceleration and just say the acceleration at time t is velocity at time t minus velocity at t minus delta t, the previous time point, that actually lags uh, by half delta t. And he points out that the true estimate, let's say v, v star t here, might actually be the average, better to take the average of v t and v of the next uh, track point, which would be on the Garmin V of t plus one second, since that actually, think about it, that covers the red region below. 
So if you like, uh, our point T is midway between T minus delta T and T plus delta T. So taking the average of uh, VT and VT plus 1 basically covers that region. Okay. And if you do that, then uh, we have a better uh, estimate of acceleration here. And that's actually V of T plus delta T, so 1 time step ahead minus v of t minus delta t, that's one time step behind, divided by two times uh, the interval, which in our case will be just two seconds. That's how we calculate acceleration uh, more precisely. Uh, we're going to be needing acceleration to plug into a formula. Now, if we take each track point, we can actually calculate some kind of virtual elevation. So we can calculate delta elevation, the change in elevation, and it's going to be equal to the slope times the velocity times delta t. So how do we calculate that slope? Well, here's my um, Python function for calculating that slope, and I'd like to sort of take you through some of the bits that uh, this formula requires. So slope is a function that returns a value and that value plugs into the delta elevation formula up top, and that's going to give us second by second what the uh, virtual elevation change will be. And we're going to be looking at the virtual elevation change graph, and from that we'll be eyeballing it to figure out um, the, um, how efficient aerodynamically uh, our velomobile is. So. This formula requires several things. Uh, it requires the watts. Uh, I already mentioned that came from the pedals. And because it's the, the wattage is reported from the pedals, um, there is some loss of efficiency uh, from the wattage that we force we put in the pedals uh, through the chain system. And um, basically, we need to multiply by a factor less than one uh, which um, should account for the fact that I have a derailleur system plus two idlers. Now, there's been some um, lab tests uh, where people have claimed and shown that the um, uh, two-by system has about 96% efficiency. So the factor efficiency would be 0.96. But we have two other idlers also in operation on the Velomobile, and I'm not sure what data there is, what lab data there is about the efficiency of those idlers. So I think uh, let's estimate them at being, uh, you know, two percent uh, loss. So they they we have to multiply again by 0 0.98 twice. Okay, so that's how we calculate the reduction from the wattage that's actually uh, applied at the pedals. What else will we need? Well, we also need the mass. The total mass of the Velomobile plus me, plus the water bottle, plus my helmet, shoes, tools, uh, my uh, lighting uh, that's permanent there, plus uh, my radar, plus uh, my um, daytime flashes, front and rear, plus a heavy battery. And for me, unfortunately, that works out to be 107 kilos. Okay. Uh, so one reason why I climb a little bit slower in the Velomobile. We will also need G, and G is the gravitational constant, and we can take a nominal value for that. Uh, it's actually repeated three times in this formula. We'll just take that as 9.81 meters per second squared. So, what else are we looking at? Well, one of the very important things that we'll have to estimate is the coefficient of rolling resistance. Now, I don't have a great idea what that figure might be, but we have some ballpark figures from road bike tests that we can plug into, um, basically, as uh, a tentative value in the system. We can vary this value so we can see what happens when that, when that occurs. The next thing we want to look at is the CDA. And the CDA is, is going, to be, going to be telling us basically how aero our Velomobile is. Now that CDA formula also involves rho. 
and rho here is the air density uh, in <laughs> meters per second cube and in my case I get the uh, try to get a precise value for rho by uh, actually running a little program that goes to the uh, university's uh, department of atmospheric sciences they have a weather station on the roof and uh, I think that's about as good as I'm gonna get and then what I can do is I can grab all the values between certain time intervals and take the average and that's what I have there in line 17 rho is uh, I'm at altitude here so rho is uh, usually below one for me or around one okay uh, so I think uh, that's about it once we have those uh, all these variables determined then we can use this formula okay oh one more thing is uh, a is acceleration but we already covered that in the previous slide okay now let's turn to the actual route that I use and the actual route that I, I use looks like this as you can see I'm animating the Garmin Connect thing uh, I just go around and around and around uh, on this very short course which is about one kilometer long and uh, I'll explain some features of this uh, particular thing. So I hit the begin lap button at this point on the course. I then proceed downhill and then uphill towards the um, loop at the end. Uh, it's actually a cul-de-sac there and I go around basically uh, rotary at that point and it's very very important when I go around not to break. The formula I just uh, showed you uh, um, doesn't account for braking and actually if we break we don't have any idea how hard we um, we actually were braking so there's no way to measure that. So it's very important during this error testing that you find a course where you do not have to brake. Okay so the uphill helps to kill the speed so we can go around without braking. Once we're around the cul-de-sac then the uphill becomes a downhill and the downhill then becomes an uphill and when I get to the exact same point where I began my lap I hit the lap button again to end the lap. After that in front of me I have a rotary and I really need to brake at this point because uh, I, I cannot get around that rotary without braking. Okay. I would flip the velomobile over on its side uh, and uh, it's in the section when other cars could be coming so um, it's very important we do this. So that portion because it's beyond the end of the lap and it's the next lap I don't, uh, I don't take that information. Uh, I just go around that uh, rotary and, and then uh, when I get to the begin lap position I hit the lap button again. Okay. So that's the basic route that I use for this kind of testing. What's really cool is that uh, and important is that we loop around to the same elevation point. Okay, so um, net gain is, is zero and we don't need to know the exact elevation which is also cool um, in order to determine how arrow our bike is. Okay. Now if we apply the formula that I gave uh, for the track point with all those parameters we will get something like the um, uh, cyclical uh, elevation chart that you see here from my, uh, from my, my Garmin. It will look different from this um, but we would like to make it so that uh, the elevation points are fa fairly close uh, in character um, to, to this thing. In other words, we want to make sure that the thing is kind of level, okay? Because we're going back to the same point each time, so net elevation gain loss should, <laughs> should be zero, okay? 